Domestication is often seen as being the kickstarter for human civilization as we know it, and it's hard to disagree. The domestication of many early plant species meant humans no longer had to worry about going hungry or dying of starvation, which is pretty good. I mean, who doesn't like having all their food in one easily accessible place? After the plants, dogs and cats were soon to follow, and after them came the classic animals everyone is familiar with today. Known today as the Big Five, these animals were domesticated for a multitude of uses, ranging from the practical to the very tasty. But let's not forget that these animals were once wild, and some mad people had to go out and tame them to become the animals we know today. But how did they do this? Well, let's find out. So I've used the term the big five, but who actually are the big five animals? Well, they are sheep, goats, cows, pigs, and horses. Yes, I know there are other domesticated animals such as donkeys and camels, but they don't make up the majority of the 60% of all mammals on land today. Yes, 60% of all mammals on land today are domesticated. But despite this prevalence in the modern day, there is no one actual definition for domestication. Over the years, several definitions have been coined, involving factors such as the animal's use to humans, its ability to produce food, or the animal's adaptation to the captive environment. Fortunately, whilst people argue over the definition, we do know which animals are classed as domesticated. So let's get on with it. Starting with... The first animal out of the five to have been domesticated was our woolly friend the sheep. Despite their coats being so distinctive, this was actually a secondary feature bred in them over multiple generations, peaking in certain breeds such as the merino. These domesticated sheep were thought to have appeared sometime around 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. Get used to hearing that folks. The earliest sheep probably look similar to the Asiatic mouflon. These creatures are evolved for the mountainous regions of the area and possessed large horns like those of modern day rams. However, fortunately for us, their young lack these giant horns. Fortunate because like most domestication events, it started with the separation of young from the wild herds. Once separated from the wild, the environment in which these youngsters were placed in changed a lot about them. With no predators around and a constant access to food, these sheep slowly began to develop features such as a reduced horn length, bone density, and flight or fight responses. Evidence on whether these features were consciously selected for isn't known, but it was definitely useful for us. Following on from sheep, we have one for all you astrology fans. Yes, it's every pragmatic's favourite animal, the goat. These creatures first appear in their domestic forms around the same time as sheep in the Fertile Crescent. Again, these guys appear to have descended from the Bezoar Ibex. However, this isn't known from DNA data like most species relationships, but from morphological and behavioural data instead. This is because all species within the genus Capra are interfertile with one another. And just to complicate things, most domesticated animals show evidence of introgression. This is a process of transferring genetic material between species. So this makes tracing the lineage of goat ancestry a bit harder. What we do know is that the process of domesticating these animals would be similar to sheep, involving taking young individuals and separating them from the wild herds. Man, there is a lot of child kidnapping involved in this process. Anyway, once here, they would have undergone all the typical physical and mental changes seen in domestic animals. But this isn't all domestication does. I couldn't find an easy place to put this, so I'll just talk about it here. Domestic animals are more likely to have twins than wild animals. This is because in the wild, having lots of children to care for is costly and risky as you'll have to protect them from predators and just the world at large. But when someone is taking care of those problems for you, the pressure is released and you're allowed to have as many kids as you'd like and boy do they. Anyway, with that tangent aside, let's move on to... Descending from the wild boar, pigs began their domestication process 9,000 years ago in, you guessed it, 
the Fertile Crescent. This isn't the case for all breeds, however, as certain domestic populations around the world have been found to have descended from different subspecies of the wild boar. With a wide distribution, the wild boar was a clear candidate for domestication. However, it's not clear how exactly they were domesticated. All we know is that there was a lot of introgression between wild and domestic populations over time. So much so that pigs who escape from farms today often revert back to a form similar to that of the wild boar. Strap yourselves in folks because we're going back yet again to the Fertile Crescent for the domestication of the cow. Man, who'd have thought it that the birthplace of agriculture would also be the origin point for so many domesticated species? Interestingly however, cattle have undergone two distinct domestication events. One in the Fertile Crescent and one in what is now modern day Pakistan. Both of which are derived from two subspecies of the same bovine, the auroch. These beasts were described by Julius Caesar, of all people, as being a little below the elephant in size and of the appearance, colour and shape of a bull. Their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast which they have espied. But not even when taken very young can they be rendered familiar to men and tamed. Well, joke's on him because we still managed to domesticate them. How we did it, however, isn't well known, but the reason for their domestication is, which was primarily for food, but perhaps maybe milk as well. Research shows that milk exploitation is much older than once thought, which has helped shape opinion on the technology of these early Neolithic farmers. What's also interesting is that genetic evidence has revealed that all modern day European cattle are descended from only 80 female auroch which must make for some interesting family reunions. Finally, we come to the horse, which, wait, wasn't actually domesticated in the Fertile Crescent? Yes, in fact, horses are actually a recent addition to the domestic world, only having been domesticated around 5,000 years ago in Russia. Surprisingly, the first use of these horses wasn't for transportation, but instead for food. However, it wasn't long before humans realised their potential as beasts of burden. Young foals would have been taken at a young age from herds and tamed for riding, before being eaten at the end of their life. The neural genes required for riding must have been rare in wild horses, as all modern day relatives can trace their parentage back to only one founder. Man, and I thought cows were bad. But hey, who said domestication was pretty? And that's all five of the big five covered. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed the video, learning all about the domestication of the big five. If you know anyone else interested in this topic, please send the video their way. And if you want to know more about this wonderful world of ours, consider subscribing. Anyway, until next time, bye bye With a what?